My name is Chris Dixon. I'm project manager with Seattle Tunnel Partners. Um, we're here today to talk about the hyperbaric interventions. Uh, this will be the third set of hyperbaric interventions that we've performed on the job. Uh, we performed some late in uh, 2013, early 2014 after the TBM initially stopped. More recently, when we were stopped at Safe Haven 3, we spent about six weeks there uh, doing um, 125 hyperbaric interventions uh, before leaving Safe Haven 3 and tunneling under the viaduct. We've reached a point now where we've chosen to uh, do maintenance on a TBM. Due to the depth and the ground conditions, uh, we need to perform hyperbaric interventions again to do that maintenance. Seattle Tunnel Partners has a subcontract with Ballard Marine Construction and what they're providing to STP are hyperbaric services on the project. We've been working with STP from the planning phases many, many years ago to get the systems up and running that they need to provide support for uh, Bertha when she's underground and underground water. We provide uh, some of the chambers and uh, some of the compressed air workers and all chamber operators on site as well as uh, medical staff. It's basically three main components. Here at the surface, we have what we call a medical lock with an adjoining bathroom. On the other side of the medical lock, you'll see a hyperbaric shuttle, which is a pressurized chamber that can travel from the medical lock here down into the tunnel all the way to the TBM, where we reach the third component of the hyperbaric system, which are the man locks that we use to actually access the work area inside the TBM. So what we do is we remove some of the material from the cutter head and we put bentonite in and we start introducing air. What the air does is it forces the bentonite into the surrounding soils and creates what we call a filter cake. The filter cake is more or less an impervious membrane that does a couple things. It keeps soil and water from coming through the soil into this chamber and it also keeps air from escaping from this work zone. The workers come in, they work on platforms, and they inspect the cutting tools. So we rotate a spoke, and we check all the cutting tools on both sides of the spoke, replace what's necessary. Then we rotate again to expose the next spoke. So we, we, do, we do a 1 8 rotation eight times to see the eight different spokes in this work area. Once we complete that whole cycle, then the maintenance is basically done. The other thing that we do sometimes is welding or cutting. So under those conditions, the workers go in with uh, helmets on so they can work and still breathe fresh air through the helmets. When they compress, the, uh, the air becomes more dense, so it's going to get hot. They're, they'll feel the pressure on their ears, they've got to equalize that. So we, uh, we train all the workers to go in in that environment and we use commercial divers as well. So they're used to that. Um, but the air becomes humid, the voice changes a little bit, it gets a little bit higher pitched. Um, there are some changes. We've got several modes of communication. We've got a phone um, handset that goes directly to the supervisor on shift. That supervisor also has uh, at least one, usually two, video feeds with lights and control of those of those lights and, and video cameras uh, that are mounted up front. So they're seeing the work happen and directing the work via phone uh, real time. We've also got uh, radio systems with uh, loudspeaker and intercom systems built into each one of the chambers and uh, on a loudspeaker up front. This medical lock is here. If we need to do extended periods of work, people can live in here for up to 28 days under pressure. We haven't had to use the shuttle yet. We've gone through a lot of drills, so we know the process of connecting it, but it's basically just a transport device used in two instances. One, if someone's injured and we need to get them from the TBM to the medical lock, and two, if we have people living in here for 28 days that need to go back and forth between the medical lock and the TBM to work, then we use the shuttle to transport them. The maximum time is going to depend entirely on the pressure. 
which depends on how much water can get through the soil and where the, the water table is. But we're looking uh, at right around 2.4 to 2.6 bar of pressure. Uh, right now we're looking at 30 to 45 minutes of, of work time. Basically what we do is we have seven crews of five people each. There's three STP people and two Ballard employees on each crew. So with these seven crews, each being able to work a half hour, we rotate them on a 24 hour basis. We're getting um, just a few hours of work accomplished every day. We did 125 interventions while we were stopped at Safe Haven 3. That's rotating this, these uh, seven crews continuously on a 24 hour basis. That took six weeks. The workers on a standard day of interventions will come in, uh, report to the medical, medical facilities on Bertha. They'll then uh, enter the man locks. They'll compress, conduct their work up front, and uh, come back into the, the man locks for decompression. They'll then exit the chamber, return to the, to the doctor at the, at the medic station for uh, an immediate physical, uh, for a second physical. Uh, they'll then remain in the medical quarters with the, with the physician uh, for another hour for observation and undergo a third physical exam. They're then free to go. Thank you.